What do you think about all this recent uh, bashing of India and Hindus in the, the media? Because you see it in like India naturally, that's a natural mm -hmm. position. But you're seeing a lot of it increasing even abroad. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing it everywhere, like the BBC, you see it in um, New York Times, you see it all across the media. It's like any small thing happens in India, like let's say someone stone, um, mm -hmm. sorry, chucked a stone at um, a church or something. Mm -hmm. It becomes like, that's it. This is Hindu fascism and BJP and all that stuff. Yes, well, it has a lot to do with the uh, Narendra Modi government. Yeah. You see, uh, just before he came to power, there was a lot of writing against him. For instance, uh, The Economist, which normally should support Modi's economic policies, nevertheless said that Modi is not the right man for the job. You know, after economically the Congress government had performed abysmally, still the, the Economist favored Congress over the BJP. Then you see when Modi came to power, there was a bit of, uh, you know, sizing it up and, um, you know, you know, initially this idea of now they are going to throw 100 million Muslims into the Indian Ocean or so, that apparently was not happening. So at first I didn't know very well what to say. But now they have uh, gotten their act together and again you see the same anti-Modi or anti-Hindu animus is at work. Mm. And so if they can't get Modi on things that have really happened, they would gladly invent anything. I mean, for example, you saw the situation about a church which then was found out was attacked by a few Christians and there was a mm. drunkard or something. There was about two free churches. and. Um, even though there was about 300 Hindu temples which had been attacked mm -hmm. during the same period. You see the situation with the nun being raped, with this whole image was made, and I mean, all across the world, mm -hmm. Hindus, you know, they're probably involved in everything. It turns out to be a few Bangladeshi Muslims, mm -hmm. and suddenly it's a kind of pin silent, you know. Yes, you see that thing about uh, the Christian nun being raped, I have heard on TV in Belgium. Now, the TV news has only a few items, you see, as opposed to a newspaper. So they pick out those that are most important. Now, to pick up a single rape in a distant country, India, is extremely exceptional. You see, every day there are rapes of Hindu women in Bangladesh. They never make the news, not even in the newspaper. And so this one about the Christian nun suddenly... I mean, clearly there were powerful forces at work. And the, um, once they found out what had really happened, that did not come into the news at all. So very many TV watchers in my country have come away with the impression, oh my God, what are these Hindus doing? Uh, the fact that uh, Bangladeshi Muslims were found out to have done it is similar to what happened in about uh, the year 2000, when churches in South India were attacked. Mm. And pamphlets, you know, with a conspicuous Hindu Twaldeen were left behind. But then later, you see, uh, uh, two terrorists, uh, well, mishandled the bomb they were carrying. They themselves were killed. Yeah. So their getaway car was just standing there. The police found it and then that led to the whole gang. And it turned out to be the Dindar Anjuman, a Muslim organization. Mm. that was falsely trying to pit the Christians against the Hindus. Yeah, yeah. So you see, this is somewhat similar. So why haven't the Hindus been able to like take on the media and, you know, and the academia as well? It's like, you know, if you're getting defamed and slandered, there are legal options as well, mm -hmm. especially abroad. Yeah. Why haven't they really gone after them? Because, you know, you're getting defamed and slandered all the time. Mm -hmm. We see it with other religious groups, they do. Yes, well, um, if you compare India with China, for example, it is obvious that scholars um, systematically working against China would not get a visa to yeah, go yeah. do research in China. Now, India doesn't take such measures at all. Why is that? I mean, why have they got this very weak kind of soft image? And Well, uh, two very different reasons. One is that people willfully um, work against India, even from India itself. And uh, most ferociously, in fact, Indians working outside of India. 
Okay. Like in Berkeley, an institute has been founded for the armed liberation of India. For some Western uh, military intervention in India, like there had been in Iraq mm -hmm. and in India. Uh, so, and this is not some American ploy using Indians. No, you see, this is an Indian initiative. Yeah, yeah. So in India there are people ferocious. Oh yeah, we know, the, we know the so Modi many. Government. And you you can't believe they get away with it. Yeah. They're going back and forth to India all the time. Right. But there's so, no prosecution, nothing. No. So the second factor is uh, the Hindus themselves, who are not standing up firmly enough for their yeah, interests. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not that they should install a dictatorship, that they should, you know, exert a total repression against everybody not like them. But at least to see uh, uh, somewhere the line is being crossed. Because I, I get really an impression difficult. that they really want to keep this very really peace-loving image, Gandhi, Jainism, and you know Jain Ahimsa type of stuff, and mm. look very soft and everything. Somehow that's going to convince everybody. Yes. Even though it's not going to, but it hasn't to to date. You know. Well, you know, position. you could perhaps say what some Hindus say. Well, after all, you see this policy, even though at the level of publicity is not yielding any positive results, ultimately has uh, still allowed India to flourish, to remain as it is. You know, you, you have a lot of uh, negative experiences at the level of words, like for example, Obama's parting speech in India, yeah. you know, where you know all had been very, very chummy the few days before, and then yeah. suddenly he came out as an agent of the American Christian mm -hmm. yes, against yeah. the Hindus. So that's not nice, but ultimately that doesn't matter so much. Sticks mm -hmm. and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could take that position as a Hindu that, you know, ultimately we're going to win, even though now you see it's, it's harder. Mm -hmm. You know, the going is tougher than for China or Japan, who are more you know, yeah. considerate, who, who take more measures in this regard. So that's one thing you could say. However, um, I agree that um, India should be more alert in this regard and you know, should do more. Like for example, it could set up uh, institutes abroad or nominate yeah. people abroad who are far more favorable. Mm -hmm. You know, in uh, 2002, the BJP government at that time under Atal Bihari Vajpayee founded a chair for Indic studies in Oxford University. And so all the papers in India were wild about this uh, saffronization of education, you know, that the, the, the Hindu militants were trying to influence in education. Now instead, what happened was that the Hindus in government were trying to show their secular face, hoping to get a pat on the shoulder from the secularists which of course never materialized, and therefore nominated a known secularist, a known critic of the Hindu movement as their professor in Oxford. So the poster boy for saffronization was in fact a known anti-Hindu. Hindu-phobic, yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. So, you see, Hindus at that level do not seem to have their strategy together yet. Now we know, you know, um, we know that ourselves because um, we often say, why haven't you set up some professional academia? And even if you can't set it in India, set it abroad, you can do it. Mm -hmm. There's many young Hindu men and women, quite intelligent, who could take up. Yes, I am uh, very pleasantly surprised by the new generation mm -hmm. in India. You see, I've met many talented men and women who uh, have become Hindu activists without yeah. any prodding from the official side. Yeah, totally. I mean, if they were helped, you know, given resources, a bit of finance and everything, they would really do the job. It would turn yeah. everything around within probably a few years. Then at the level of media, which is very important to yeah. condition these masses, a lot could be done. A lot. Like, uh, the Muslim world has this Al Jazeera, you know, there's Russian TV, there's a Chinese yeah. channel, you know, a similar Indian channel obvious that this should I mean you see it yourself like mm -hmm. uh, like you know on f uh, Facebook mm -hmm. you see how many people follow you and you can see there's a lot of potential there mm -hmm. and you think just imagine if these guys and these uh, women were given a chance backing you know um, the finance and resources to do research and everything mm -hmm. 
they would turn everything around within six months. Yes, so. I don't think that we should be satisfied with the social media in the sense that, you know, we still should try to um, show our, uh, our opinion, you know, make our stand in academe, in uh, traditional forms of research and publishing, yep. in traditional media. Nevertheless, at the same time, it should be acknowledged that for the Hindus, the social media are a boon. And it's are very the, the thing is, media. I mean, it's very there. Is, it is good, and I see a good potential there. But it does have its limitations of because course, of course. Um, you see a lot of Hindus every two days. You get petitions getting sent across. Mm -hmm. Do a petition, that job's done. Most of the petitions don't get anywhere. If you follow it up with a strategy and action on the ground as well, and many other kind of ways which you can do it, then you've got to make an impact. And that is what is needed. Mm -hmm. We need to you know, set up things which can help a lot of these Hindus train, up, train them up in a way that can get them more active and mm -hmm. also get results. Yes, yes. you see the social media also uh, work uh, for the anti-Hindu establishment yep. as a safety valve. You see, people can have their say and yet not make an impact. It's, it's a form of a repressive tolerance. Yeah. So it can work both ways. But at the same time, you see, it creates some consciousness. It reaches some Hindus that otherwise would be uh, unreached. And so, you see, that potential should then, of course, be transmuted into some more serious form of power. Yes, in that respect, the present government is not doing its duty. Okay. I mean, at long last, it is in a position to really change the power equation at that level where the militant secularists have had a power totally incommensurate to their numbers. Mm. And so really something could be done about it easily, but you see the government has to... Why is it mind it's taking its time? Well, because the Hindus in power are still under the impression that secularism is uh, hegemonic, is uh, the dominant ideology, and so too many of them are still trying to appease uh, the secularists are still trying to look secularist and are still uncomfortable with taking a Hindu stand. And the thing is, um, if you ask any of them what secularism means, they always give you the wrong answer. It's like nobody in India mm -hmm. even knows what secularism means. That's the strangest thing is, yes. and they claim to be secular, then you know, we know by European definition mm -hmm. of secularism, India is not really secular either. Right. No, India is not a secular state. But they believe all. they are secular though. Yes. So when you ask them, you te the test is, you just ask anyone what does secularism mean in India, because they chant it all the time, like mm -hmm. a mantra, they always give you the wrong answer. Yes, you see a, a very easy uh, criterion there. Uh, Arab Muslims abhor the notion of secularism. You see secularism, democracy, they are totally opposed to the Islamic conception of uh, legitimate uh, legislation, which is given by God. Mm. And so it is the Sharia and not democratically voted laws. So they abhor secularism. Yet in India, precisely the same type of people all call themselves secularists. Secularist. Yeah, yeah. So secularism in India has effectively a very different meaning, namely being anti-Hindu. So you can be a missionary, you can be a mullah, and you see by Western definition be anything but secular, and yet in India Kant is a secularist. Yeah, and because a great you have the virtue well. of being anti-Hindu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's a total do a wrong definition because mm -hmm. we know. Because you see um, Christians themselves in India saying that secularism is um, in danger. Yes. And it makes you laugh because we know why secularism came in the first mm -hmm. place, against Christianity. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the, the phrase presupposes that there is secularism which can be put in danger. Now, India is not a secular state at all. The uh, prime definition of secularism, at the very least, includes the equality of all citizens before the law, regardless of their religion. Now, that criterion in India is not fulfilled at all. You see, there, are no, um, there is no s uh, common civil code. You see, there are different laws depending upon what religion you belong to. Mm. Now, you see, this may be defensible, perhaps, but at any rate, it is not secularism. Yeah, yeah.